I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, But in there somewhere and all that is a a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Well, let's blah, blah, blah with me. Um, I have a nook, which I'm not sure if I've already talked about in the previous episode, but I took a closet that was right next to the bathroom, and it had two big doors that folded back. Uh, and behind it was a crawl space that kind of goes back behind the bathroom. So I decided, uh, I'm going to make that a reading nook. Because I used to have one back at the condo when I turned my dining room into a reading nook. And, uh, dagnab it, I loved it. I had all my books in there, a big comfy chair. I used to hang out with mood lighting and sit and read. I even had a fake fireplace that, uh, would heat up the area and stuff. Oh, it was so snuggly. But then moving into the new house, uh, I lost my reading nook. And so I've been sitting around thinking, boy, I can't wait till one of my kids goes off to college. Because then I'm going to get a reading nook, uh, with a clear out that bedroom but that's years away so finally I snapped and saw that this closet's big enough to squeeze a chair in and some bookshelves so I did and I put lamps in there and I've got all sorts of fun stuff it's a it's nice then my brother-in-law who was helping me cap off the creepy part that goes back behind the uh, bathroom uh, build a little fake wall he said you know you could probably record your podcast in here And I said, ooh, that's right. So I got up a a blanket to kind of cover a a wall that's really echoey. And then here I am, reading in my reading nook. A cute little place for a man to do his tiny little podcast. Uh, So with that, uh, I have nothing else to report. Work has been stinking. Uh, Got work to do that's taking forever. It's frustrating. And that's kind of it. I got uh, kids that are going back to school soon. Maybe. It's still up in the air if they're going to do remote learning. Uh, They're talking about doing like a hybrid half and half thing. So uh, everything is frustrating. With that, let's uh, dive into our story. Leonid 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 I cannot pronounce his first name Andreev and I can say his last name I think I kind of nailed that uh, he's Russian he was born in August 1871 and died in September of 1919 he was a Russian playwright novelist and short story writer who is considered to be the father of expressionism in Russian literature He is one of the most talented and prolific representatives of the Silver Age period. Andreev's style combines elements of realist, naturalist, and symbolist schools in literature. Uh, That's all from Wikipedia. The rest of his life is kind of sort of average. He was born in a middle-class family in Moscow. He studied law. Eh, These aren't exciting things. So with that, let's uh, dive into the story. And that story is Lazarus. Uh, A story I remember reading in some collection of weird short stories when I was a kid. And I remember it being really weird and sad. I didn't know much about the Bible at the time. I just knew it had something to do with a guy that Jesus raised from the dead. A guy who was Jesus' best friend. Or a really close friend. And he uh, died. And one of the sisters came to Jesus and said... uh, the guy you like so much is dead and Jesus was in a different town Jesus said okay and Jesus stuck around there for a few more days and by the time Jesus worked his way over to uh, Bethany I think where Lazarus lived uh, Lazarus had been dead four days 
So Jesus goes in and brings him back from the dead. And uh, and then that's kind of it. He sets Lazarus off. Uh, you know, go ahead, go on and live your life. Uh, Russian Orthodox beliefs say that he was never happy again after that. Never smiled again. Because he had seen so much horrible stuff in his four days in hell. Which is shocking. Why is the guy who's such good friends with Jesus uh, spending all that time in hell? What did he do? Do we all go to hell? It's weird. How perfect do you have to be to not go to hell? Anyways, with that, here is uh, Lenoid's Lenid's version of what happened to Lazarus. When Lazarus rose from the grave after three days and nights in the mysterious thraldom of death and returned alive to his home, it was a long time before anyone noticed the evil peculiarities in him that were later to make his name terrible. His friends and relatives uh, were jubilant that he had come back to life. Oh, they surrounded him with tenderness. Ah, they were lavish with their eager attentions, spending the greatest care upon his food and drink and the new garments they made for him. They clad him gorgeously in the glowing colors of hope and laughter, and when arrayed like a bridegroom, <laughs> I didn't say that right, bridegroom, he sat at a table with them again, ate again, and drank again. Ah, they wept fondly on some of the neighbors to look upon the man miraculously raised from the dead. Ah, the neighbors came and were moved with joy. Strangers arrived from distant cities and villages to worship the miracle. Uh, they burst into stormy exclamations and buzzed around the house of Mary and Martha like so many bees. That which was new in Lazarus's face and gestures, they explained naturally as the traces of his severe illness and the shock he had passed through. It was evident that the uh, disintegration of the body had been halted by a miraculous power. But that the restoration had not been complete, that death had left upon his face and body the effect of an artist's unfinished sketch, seen through a thin glass. On his temples, under his eyes, and in the hollow of his cheek, lay a thick, earthy blue. His fingers were blue, uh, too, and under his nails, which had grown long in the grave, uh, the blue had turned livid. Here and there, on his lips and body, the skin blistered at the grave and burst open and left a reddish, glistening cracks, as if covered with a thin, glassy slime. Oh, and he had grown exceedingly, exceedingly stout. His body was horribly bloated ah, and suggested the fetid, damp smell of putrefaction. Ah, but the cadaverous heavy odor that clung to his burial garments and, as it seemed, to his very body, soon wore off, and after some time the blue of his hands and face softened, and the reddish cracks of his skin, eh, smoothed out. Though they never disappeared completely, such was the aspect of Lazarus in his second life. It looked natural only to those who had seen him buried. Not merely Lazarus's face, uh, but his very character, it seemed, had changed. Though it astonished no one, and did not attract the attention deserved. Before his death, uh, Lazarus had been cheerful uh, and careless, a lover of laughter and harmless jest. It was because of his good humor, uh, pleasant and equitable, uh, his freedom from the meanness and gloom, that uh, he had been so beloved by the master. Now he was grave and silent. Neither he himself jested, nor did he laugh at the jests of others. And the words he spoke, uh, occasionally, eh, were simple, ordinary, and necessary words. Words as much devoid of sense and depth as are the sounds with which an animal expresses pain and uh, pleasure and thirst and hunger. Such words uh, a man may speak all his life, and no one would ever know the sorrows and joys that dwelt within him. Thus it was that Lazarus sat at the festive table among his friends and relatives, uh, his face, the face of a corpse, over which, for three days, death had reigned in darkness. His uh, garments, uh, gorgeous, festive, glittering with gold, bloody red and purple, his mane heavy and silent. He was horribly changed and uh, strange, but as yet undiscovered. In high waves, now mild, now stormy, the festivities went on round him. Warm glances of love caressed his face, still cold with the uh, touch of the grave, and his friends warm and hand-patted his bluish, heavy hand, and the music played joyous tunes mingled to the sounds of the terampium, ah, the pipe, the zither, and the dulcimer, 
<laughs> it was as if bees were humming, a locust buzzing, and birds singing over the happy home of Mary and Martha. Someone uh, recklessly lifted the veil. By one breath of an uttered word, he destroyed the serene charm and uncovered the truth of its ugly nakedness. No one thought uh, was clearly defined in one in his mind uh, when his lips smilingly asked, uh, Why did you not tell us, Lazarus, uh, what was there? It all became silent, struck with the question. Only now it seemed to have occurred to them that for three days Lazarus had been dead, and they looked with curiosity, awaiting an answer. Ah, but Lazarus remained silent. Uh, will you not tell us? wondered the inquirer. Uh, is it so terrible there? Again, his thought lagged behind his words. Had it preceded them, he would not have asked the question, for at the very moment he uttered it, his heart sank with a dread fear. All grew restless. They awaited the words of Lazarus anxiously. But he was silent. Ah, cold sphere, and his eyes were uh, cast down. Oh, and now, as if for the first time, they perceived the horrible bluishness of his face and the loathsome copulence of his body. On the table, as if forgotten by Lazarus, uh, lay his livid blue hand, and all eyes were riveted upon it, as though expecting the desired answer uh, from that hand. The musicians? Yeah, they still played. Uh, then silence fell upon them, too, and the gay sounds died down. As scattered coals were extinguished by water, the pipe became mute, and the ringing terampium and the murmuring dulcimer, as though a chord were broken, as though song itself were dying, the zither echoed a trembling broken sound. Then all was quiet. Will you not? repeated the inquirer, unable to uh, restrain his babbling tongue. Uh, silence reigned, and the livid blue hand lay motionless. It moved slightly, and then the company sighed with relief and raised their eyes. Lazarus, risen from the dead, was looking straight at them, embracing all with one glance, heavy and terrible. This was on the uh, third day after Lazarus had risen from the grave. Since then, many had felt that his gaze was the gaze of destruction. But neither those who had been uh, forever crushed by it, nor those uh, in the prime of their life, mysterious even as death, had found the will to resist his glance could ever explain the terror that lay immovable in the depths of his black pupils. He looked quiet and simple. One felt that he had uh, no intention to hide anything, but also no intention to uh, tell anything. His look was uh, cold, as uh, one who is entirely indifferent to all that is alive. And many careless people who pressed around him and did not notice later learned with wonder and fear the name of this stout, quiet man who brushed against them with his sumptuous, gaudy garments. The sun did not stop shining when he looked, neither did the uh, fountain cease playing. And the eastern sky remained cloudless and blue as always, but the man who fell under his inscrutable gaze could no longer feel the sun, nor the uh, fountain, nor recognize the native sky. Sometimes he would cry bitterly, uh, sometimes tear his hair in despair and madly call for help, but generally it happened that the men thus stricken by the gaze of Lazarus began to fade away listlessly and quietly and pass into a slow death lasting many long years. Ah, they died in the presence of everybody, colorless, haggard, and gloomy. Ah, trees withering on rocky ground. Those who screamed in madness sometimes came back to life, but the others, eh, uh, mm, never. So you will not tell us, eh, uh, uh, Lazarus, uh, what you saw there? The inquirer repeated for the third time, but now his voice was dull. A dead, gray weariness looked stupidly out of his eyes. Uh, the faces of all present were also covered by the same dead, gray weariness like a mist. The guests stared at one another uh, stupidly, not knowing why they had come together or why they sat around this rich table. They stopped talking uh, and vaguely felt it was time to uh, leave. But they could not overcome the lassitude that spread through their muscles. So they continued to sit there, each one isolated, like little dim lights scattered in the darkness of night. The musicians uh, were paid to play, and they took up again the instruments and again played gay or mournful airs. But it was music made to order, always the same tunes, and the guests listened wonderingly. Why was this music necessary? They thought. Why is it uh, necessary, and what good did it do for the people to pull at strings and blow their cheeks into thin pipes? 
and uh, produce varied and strange sounding noises. How badly they play, said someone. Uh, the musicians were insulted and left. Then the guests departed one by one, for it was nearing night, and when the uh, quiet darkness enveloped them, and it became easier to breathe, the image of Lazarus suddenly rose before each one in stern splendor. There he stood, with the blue face of a corpse and the remnant of a bridegroom, sumptuous and resplendent, in his eyes that cold stare in the depths of which lurked, in italics, the horrible exclamation point. They stood still as if turned to stone. The darkness uh, surrounded them, and in the midst of the darkness flamed at the horrible apparition and the supernatural vision of one who for three days uh, had lain under the measureless power of death. Three days he had been dead. Thrice had the sun risen and set, and he had lain dead. Ah, uh, the children had played, the water had murmured, and it streamed over rocks. Uh, the hot dust uh, had clouded the highway, and he had been dead. And now he was among men again. It touched them, looked at them, and then in italics, looked at them. And through the black rings of his pupils, as though dark glasses, the unfathomable three gazed upon humanity. No one took care of Lazarus, and no friends or kindred uh, remained with him. Only the great desert, uh, enfolding the holy city, came close to the threshold of his abode. It entered his home and laid down on his couch like a, like a spouse. It put out all the fires. No one cared for Lazarus. No one, after the other, went away, even his sisters. Uh, Mary and Martha. For a long while, Martha did not want to leave him, but she knew not who would nurse him or take care of him, and she cried and prayed. But one night, when the wind was roaming about the desert and the rustling cypress trees were bending over the roof, she dressed herself quietly and quietly went away. Lazarus probably heard how the door was slammed. It did not shut properly, and the wind kept knocking it continually against the post. Uh, but he did not arise, and he did not go out, did not try to find out the reason. And the whole night, until the morning, the cypress trees hissed over his head, and the door swung to and fro, allowing the cold, greedily prowling desert to enter his dwelling. Everybody shunned him uh, as though he were a, 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 a leper. They wanted to put a bell on his neck to avoid meeting him. But someone, turning pale, remarked it would be terrible if at night, under the windows, one should happen to hear Lazarus's bell, and all grew pale and assented. Since he did nothing for himself, he would probably have starved had not his neighbors, in trepidation, saved some uh, food for him. Children brought it to him. Uh, they did not fear him. Neither did they laugh at him in the innocent cruelty in which children often laugh at unfortunates. They were indifferent to him, and Lazarus showed the same indifference to them. Oh, he showed no desire to thank them for their services, and he did not uh, try to pat the dark hands and look into the simple, shining little eyes. And abandoned to the ravages of time in the desert, his house was falling to ruins, and his hungry, bleeding goats had long been scattered among his neighbors. His wedding garments had grown old, and he wore them without changing them, as he had donned them on that happy day when the musicians played. I did not see the difference between old and new, uh, between torn and whole. The brilliant colors were burnt and faded, the vicious dogs of the city, and the sharp thorns of the desert had rent the fine clothes to, uh, to shreds. During the day, when the sun beat down mercilessly upon all living things, and, and even the scorpions uh, hid under stones, convulsed with a mad desire to sting, he sat motionless in the burning rays, lifting high his blue face and shaggy wild beard. Yet, while the people were unafraid to speak to him, same uh, one had asked him, uh, Poor Lazarus, do you find it pleasant eh, to sit so eh, and look at the sun? And he answered, uh, Yes, it is pleasant. The thought suggested itself to the people that the cold of the three days in the grave had been so intense, its darkness so deep, that there was not in all the earth enough heat or light to warm Lazarus and lighten the gloom in his eyes. And the inquirers turned away with a sigh. And when the setting sun, flat and purple-red, descended to the earth, Lazarus went into the desert and walked straight toward it, as though intending to, uh, uh, to reach it. Although he had already 
uh, walk directly towards the sun and those who tried to follow him and find out uh, what he did at night in the desert and indelibly imprinted upon their minds the vision of black silhouette of a tall, stout man against the red background of an immense dark. The horrors of the night drove them away, and so they never found out what Lazarus did in the desert, uh, but the image of the black form against the red was burned forever in their brains, like an animal with a cinder in its eye, which furiously rubs its muzzle against its paws. They foolishly rubbed their eyes, uh, but the impression left by Lazarus was ineffectual, uh, forgotten, only in death. There are people uh, living far away who never saw Lazarus, but only heard of him. With an audacious curiosity, which is stronger than fear and feeds on fear, uh, with a secret sneer in their hearts, uh -huh, some of them came uh, to him one day as he basked in the sun and entered into the conversation with him. And at the time, his appearance had changed for the better and was not so fretful. At first, the visitors uh, snapped their fingers and thought disapprovingly of the foolish inhabitants of the holy city, but then... Uh, the short talk came to an end, and they went home. Their expression was such that the inhabitants of the holy city at once knew their errand and said, uh, Here go some more madmen at whom Lazarus has looked. The speakers raised their hands in silent pity. Uh, other visitors came, uh, among them brave warriors in clinking armor, who knew not fear, and happy youths who made merry with laughter and song. Uh, busy merchants, jingling their coins, ran in for a while, and proud attendants at the temple placed their staffs at Lazarus's door, but no one returned uh, the same as he came. A frightful shadow fell upon their souls and gave a new appearance to the old, familiar world. Those who felt any desire to speak after they had been stricken by the gaze of Lazarus described the change that had come over them, uh, somewhat like this. All objects seen by the eye and palatable to the hand become empty, light and transparent, as though they were light shadows in the darkness. And this darkness enveloped the whole universe. It was dispelled neither by the sun nor by the moon nor by the stars, but embraced the earth like a mother and clothed it in boundless black veil. Into all bodies it penetrated, even into iron and stone, and the particles of the body lost their unity and became uh, lonely, even to the heart of the particles it penetrated, and the particles of the particles became lonely. Uh, the vast emptiness uh, which surrounds the universe was not filled with things seen with uh, the sun or the moon or the stars. It stretched boundless, penetrating uh, everywhere, disuniting everything, body from body, particle from particle. In emptiness, uh, the trees spread the roots, uh, themselves empty. In emptiness rose phantom temples, palaces and houses, uh, all empty. And in the emptiness proved a restless man, himself empty and light like a shadow. There was no more a sense of time. The beginning of all things and their end merged into one. In the very moment when a building was being erected and one could hear the builders striking with their hammers, one seemed already to see its ruins and then emptiness where the ruins were. A man was just born <clears throat> and funeral candles were already lighted uh, at his head. And then were extinguished, and soon there was emptiness before, uh, and uh, there, when there had been a man and the candles. Surrounded by darkness and empty waste, a uh, man troubled hopelessly before the dread of the infinite. So spoke those who had a desire to speak, but much more could probably have been told by those who did not want to talk, and who died in silence. Oh, at that time... There lived in Rome a celebrated sculptor by the name of Aurelius. Out of clay, marble, and bronze, he created forms of gods and men of such beauty that this beauty was proclaimed immortal. But he himself was not satisfied and said there was a supreme beauty that he had never succeeded in expressing in marble or bronze. I have not yet gathered uh, the radiance of the moon, he said. I have not yet caught the glare of the sun. There is no soul in my marble. There is no life in my beautiful bronze. And when by moonlight he would slowly wander along the roads, crossing black shadows of the cypress trees, his uh, white tunic flashing in the moonlight, who as he met, he used to laugh good-naturedly, say, Ah, it is moonlight that you are gathering, Aurelius. Uh, why did you not bring some baskets along? Huh. And he too would laugh and point to his eyes and say, Here! are the baskets in which I gather light of the moon and the radiance of the sun. 
And that was the truth. Uh, his eyes shone moon and sun. Uh, he could not transmit the radius to Marvel. Therein lie the greatest tragedy of his life. He was a, a descendant of an ancient race of patricians. Had a good wife uh, and children. And except in this one respect, lacked nothing. When the dark humor about Lazarus reached him, he consulted his wife and friends and decided to make the long voyage to Judea in order that he might look upon the man miraculously raised from the dead. He felt lonely uh, those days and hoped on a, a way to renew his jaded energies. Oh, what form, they told about Lazarus, did not frighten him. He had meditated much upon death. He did not like it, nor did he like those who tried to harmonize it with life. On this side, beautiful life. On the other, eh, ugh, mysterious death, he reasoned, and no one better lot could befall a man uh, than to live, to enjoy life and the beauty of living. And he already had conceived a desire to convince Lazarus of the truth of uh, this view and return his soul to life even as his body had been returned. Uh, this task did not appear impossible, for the reports about Lazarus, fearsome and strange as they were, did not tell the whole truth about him, but only carried a vague warning against something awful. Lazarus was getting up from a stone to follow the path of the setting sun on the evening when the rich Roman, accompanied by an armed slave, approached him and in a ringing voice called him, uh, Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus saw a proud and beautiful face, made radiant by fame, and white garments and precious jewels shining in the sunlight. The ruddy way, rays of the sun uh, lent to the head and face a likeness to dimly shining bronze. That was what Lazarus saw. He sank back to his seat obediently and wearily lowered his eyes. Is it true? Uh, you are not beautiful, my poor Lazarus, said the Roman quietly, playing with his gold chain. You are even uh, frightful, uh, my poor friend, and death was not lazy the day when you were so carelessly fell into its arms. But you are as fat as a barrel. Nah, and fat people are not bad, as the great Caesar said. I do not understand why people are so afraid of you. Will you permit me to stay with you overnight? It's already late and I have no abode. Nobody had ever asked Lazarus to be uh, allowed to pass the night with him. Uh, I have no bed, said he. I am somewhat of a warrior and can sleep sitting, replied the Roman. We shall make light. Uh, I have no light. Uh, they will converse in the darkness like two friends. I suppose you have some wine? Uh, I have no wine. Ah, the Roman laughed. Now I understand why you are so gloomy, and why you do not like your second life. No wine? Well, we shall do without. You know, there are a few words that go to one's heads, uh, even as Valerian wine. With a motion of his head, he dismissed the slave, ah, and they were alone. And again the sculptor spoke, but it seemed as though the sinking sun had penetrated into his words. They faded, yeah, pale and empty, as if trembling on weak feet. As if slipping and falling, drunk with the wine of anguish and despair, the black chasms appeared between the two men, like remote hints of vast emptiness and vast darkness. Now I am your guest, and you will not ill-treat me, Lazarus, uh, said the Roman. Hospitality is binding even upon those who have been three days dead. Three days, I'm told. You were in the grave. It must have been cold in there. And it must have from there that you have brought this bad habit of doing without light and wine. I like light. Ah, it gets so dark quickly here. Your, your eyebrows and forehead have an, an interesting line. Even as the ruins of castles covered with the ashes of an earthquake. Uh, but why in such strange, ugly clothes? Uh, I've seen the bridegrooms of your country. Uh, they wear clothes like that. Such ridiculous clothes. Such awful garments. Uh, are you a bridegroom? Already, the sun had disappeared. A gigantic black shadow was approaching fast from the west. As if prodigious bare feet were rustling over the sand, and the chill breezes stole up behind. In darkness you seem even bigger, Lazarus, as though you had grown stouter uh, in these last few minutes. Uh, do you feed on darkness, uh, perchance? And I would like a light, just a small light, just a, just a small light. Oh, and I'm cold. The nights here are so barbarously cold. If it were not so dark, I should say, uh, you were looking at me, Lazarus. Yeah, it seems you're looking. You are looking. Hey, you're looking at me in italics. I feel it now. You're smiling. The night had come, and a heavy blackness filled the air. 
How good will it be when the sun rises again tomorrow? You know I'm a great sculptor, so my friends call me. I create? Yes, they say I create. But for that daylight is necessary, I give life to cold marble. I melt the ringing bronze in the fire, in a bright hot fire. Uh, why'd you touch me with your hand? Come, said Lazarus, you're my guest. And they went to the house, and the shadows of the long evening fell on the earth. The slave at last grew tired, waiting for his master, and when the sun stood high, he came to the house, and he saw directly under the burning rays Lazarus and his master sitting close together. They looked straight up and were silent. The slave wept and cried aloud, Master, what ails you, master? The same day, Aurelius left for Rome. The whole way he was thoughtful and silent, attentively examining everything, the people, the ship, and the sea as though endeavoring to recall something. On the sea, a great storm overtook them, and all the while Aurelius remained on deck and gazed eagerly at the approaching and falling waves. When he reached home, his family were shocked at the terrible change in his demeanor, but he calmed them with the words, I have found it. In the dusty clothes which he had worn during the entire journey he had not changed, he began his work, and the marble ringingly responded to the resounding blows of his hammer. Long and eagerly he worked, admitting no one. At last, one morning, he announced that the work was ready and gave instructions that all his friends and the severe critics, judges of the art, be called together. When he donned gorgeous garments, shining with the gold, glowing with purple of the bison. Here's what I've created, he said thoughtfully. His friends looked, and immediately the shadow of deep sorrow covered their faces. Hey, it was a thing monstrous. Possessing none of the forms, uh, familiar to the eye, uh, yet not devoid of a hint of some new unknown form, on a thin, torturous little branch, or rather an ugly likeness of one, lay crooked, strange, unsightly, shapeless heaps of something, turned outside in, or something turned inside out, wild fragments, which seemed to be feebly trying to get away from themselves, and uh, accidentally, under one of the wild projections, they noticed a wonderfully sculptured butterfly with transparent wings, trembling as though with a weak longing to fly. Why did that wonderful butterfly, uh, Aurelius, timidly asked someone. I don't know, answered the sculpture. The truth had to be told, and one of his friends, uh, the one who loved Aurelius best, said, It's ugly, uh, my poor friend. It must be destroyed. Give me the hammer. And with two blows, he destroyed the monstrous mass, leaving only the wonderfully sculptured butterfly. After that, uh, Aurelius created nothing. He was looked at with absolute indifference at marble and bronze and his own divine creations, in which dwelt a mortal beauty. In the hope of breathing into him uh, once again the old flame of inspiration, with the idea of awakening his dead soul, his friends led him to see the beautiful creations of others. But he remained indifferent, and no smile warmed his closed lips. And only after they spoke to him, uh, much a long beauty, uh, he would re reply warily, Eh... But this is, is all a lie. In the daytime, when the sun was shining, he would go to his rich and beautifully laid-out garden, and finding a place where there was no shadow, he would expose his bare head and his dull eyes to the glitter and the burning heat of the sun. Red and white butterflies flooded around him, down into the marble cistern ran splashing water from the crooked mouth of a blissfully drunken satyr. But he stood motionless, eh, like a pale shadow of that other two, uh, in, a, in a far land, at the very gates of the stony desert. Also sat motionless under the fiery sun. And it came about finally that Lazarus was summoned to Rome by the great Augustus. They dressed him in gorgeous garments, as though it had been ordained that he was to remain a bridegroom to an unknown bride until the very day of his death. It was an old coffin, rotten and fallen apart, were regaled over and over. The gay tassels were hung on it, and solemnly they conducted him in a gala of attire, as though, it, in truth, it were a bridal procession. Oh, the runners loudly sounded the trumpet that they made the way for the ambassadors of the emperor. But the roads along which he had passed uh, were deserted. His entire native land cursed the uh, extra old name of Lazarus. The man miraculously brought to life, and the people scattered at the mere report of his horrible approach. And the trumpeters blew lonely blasts, and only the desert answered with a dying echo. 
Then they carried him across the sea on the saddest and most gorgeous ship that was ever mirrored in the azure waves of the Mediterranean. There were many people uh, aboard, but the ship was silent and still as a coffin, and the water seemed to moan as it parted before the short curved prow. Lazarus sat lonely, bearing his head to the sun, and listening in silence to the splashing of the waters. Further away, uh, the seamen and the ambassadors gathered like a crowd of distressed shadows. If a thunderstorm had happened to burst upon them at that time, or the wind had overwhelmed the red sails, the ship would probably have perished, for none of those who were on her had the strength or desire enough to fight for life. With supreme effort, some went to the side of the ship and eagerly gazed at the blue transparent abyss. Perhaps they imagined they saw a nead flashing a pink shoulder through the waves, or an insanely joyous and drunken centaur galloping by, splashing up the water uh, with his hooves. But the sea was deserted and mute, and so was the watery abyss. Listlessly, Lazarus set foot on the streets of the Eternal City, as if through all its riches, all the majesty and gigantic edifices, all the luster and the beauty and the music of refined life, were simply the echo of the wind in the desert, or the misty images of hot running sand. Chariots whirled by, and the crowd of strong, beautiful, haughty men passed on. Builders of the Eternal City and the proud partakers of its life, songs rang out, fountains laughed, pearly laughter of women filled the air while the drunkard philosophized and the sober ones smilingly listened. Uh, horseshoes rattled on the pavement, and surrounded on all sides by glad sounds, a fat, heavy man moved through the center of the city like a cold spot of silence sowing in his path grief, anger, and vague, uh, carking distress. Who dared to be sad in Rome? Indignantly demanded the frowning citizens. And uh, in two days, the swift-tongued Rome knew of Lazarus, and the man miraculously raised from the grave, and timidly evaded him. Now, there were many brave men ready to try their strength, and all their senseless call, Lazarus came obediently. The emperor was so engrossed with the state of affairs that he delayed receiving the visitor, and for seven days Lazarus moved among the people. A jovial drunkard met him with a smile on his red lips. Drink, Lazarus, drink, he cried. Would not Augustus laugh to see you drink? And naked, bespotted women laughed and decked the blue hands of Lazarus with rose leaves. But the drunkard looked into the eyes of Lazarus, and his joy ended forever. Thereafter, he was always drunk. Eh, he drank no more, but was drunk all the time, shadowed by fearful dreams instead of the joyous reveries that uh, wine gives. Fearful dreams became the food of his broken spirit. Fearful dreams uh, held him day and night in the midst of monstrous fantasy. And death itself was no more fearful uh, than the apparition of its fierce uh, pre precursor. Lazarus came to a youth, and this lass, uh, who loved each other and were beautiful in their love, proudly and strongly holding in his arms his beloved one. The youth said with a gentle piety, uh, Look at us, Lazarus, uh, and rejoice with us. Is there anything stronger uh, than love? Uh, but Lazarus looked at them, and their whole life they continued to love one another, but their love became mournful and gloomy, even as the cypress trees over the tombs that feed their roots on the putrescence of the grave and strive in vain in the quiet evening hour to touch the sky with their pointed tops, hurled by fathomless life forces into each other's arms. Ah, they mingled their kisses with tears, ah, their joy of pain, and only succeeded in realizing the more vividly a sense of their slavery to the silent nothing. Forever united, ah, forever parted. They flashed like sparks, and the sparks went out in boundless darkness. Lazarus came to a proud sage, Oh, and the sage said to him, I already know all the horrors uh, that you may tell me, Lazarus. Uh, what else can you terrify me? Uh, only a few moments passed before the sage realized that the knowledge of the horrible is not the horrible, and that the sight of death is not death, and he felt that in the eyes of the infinite wisdom and folly are the same, uh, for the infinite knows them not, and the boundaries between knowledge and ignorance, uh, between truth and falsehood, between top and uh, bottom, faded and his shapeless thought was suspended in emptiness. Uh, then he grasped his gray head in his hands and uh, cried out uh, insanely, I cannot think, I cannot think. Thus it was 
Under that cool gaze of Lazarus, the man miraculously raised from the dead. All that serves to affirm life, its sense, its joys, perished. And people began to say it is too dangerous to allow him to see the emperor, uh, that it were better to kill him and bury him secretly, oh, and swear that he had disappeared. Swords were sharpened, and youths devoted to the welfare of the people announced their readiness to become assassins. But when Augustus upset the cruel plans by demanding that Lazarus appear before him, uh, even though Lazarus could not be kept away, it was felt that the heavy impression conveyed by his face might be somewhat softened. With that end in view, uh, expert painters and barbers and artists were secured who worked the whole night on Lazarus' head. His beard was trimmed and curled, and the disagreeable and deadly bluishness of his hands and face were covered up uh, with paint. Uh, his hands were whitened, his cheeks rouged. Uh, the disgusting wrinkles of suffering that ridged his old face were patched up and painted, and on the smooth surface wrinkles of good nature and laughter, uh, and the pleasant good-humored cheeriness were laid on artistically with fine brushes. Lazarus uh, submitted indifferently to all that they did with him, and soon was transformed into a stout, uh, nice-looking old man. For all the world, a quiet and good-humored grandfather of numerous grandchildren. He, he looked uh, as though he had a smile, which uh, uh, he told funny stories and not left his lips, as though a quiet tenderness still lay hidden in the uh, corner of his eyes. Ah, uh, but the wedding dress, uh, they did not dare take off. Ooh. Uh, they did not change his eyes, the dark, terrible eyes, from out of which stared the incomprehensible there. Lazarus was untouched by the magnificence of the imperial apartments. Uh, he remained stolidly indifferent, as though he saw no contrast between his ruined house at the edge of the desert and of the solid, beautiful palace of stone. Under his feet, the hard marble of the floor took on the semblance of the moving sands of the desert, and his eyes and throngs of gaily dressed, haughty men were as unreal as the emptiness of the air. They looked not into his face as he passed by, fearing to come under the awful bane of his eyes. Ah, but when the sound of his heavy steps announced that he had passed, heads were lifted and the eyes examined with timid uh, curiosity. The figure of the corpulent, tall, slightly stooping old man as he slowly passed into the heart of the imperial palace. If death itself had appeared, men would not have had feared it so much, for hitherto death had been known to the dead only and life to the living only, and between these two were uh, had no bridge. This strange being knew death, uh, and that knowledge of his was felt to be mysterious and cursed. Uh, he will kill our great divine Augustus, men cried with horror, and they hurled curses after him, slowly and stolidly and passed them by, penetrating even deeper into the palace. Caesar uh, knew already who Lazarus was, and was prepared to meet him. He was a courageous man, then he felt the power was invincible, and in the fateful encounter with the man, wonderfully raised from the dead, he refused to lean on other men's weak help. Man to man, face to face, he met Lazarus. Uh, do not fix your gaze on me, Lazarus, he commanded. I have heard that your head is like the head of Medusa, and turns into stone all upon whom you look, uh, but I should like to have a close look at you. "'and to talk to you before I turn into stone, ah, he added in a spirit of playfulness uh, "'that concealed his real misgivings. "'Approaching him, he examined closely Lazarus' face uh, "'and his strange festive clothes. Uh, "'Though his eyes were sharp and keen, "'he was deceived by the skillful counterfeit. "'Well, your appearance not so terrible, venerable sir, "'but all the worse for men, "'and the horrible takes on such venerable and pleasant appearance. Uh, "'Now let us talk.' What is my cat doing? Oh, he's crawling underneath the big blanket thing I put up. Great. Podcasting upstairs got its drawbacks. The little boy cat is going to destroy everything in here. Oh, there he goes. Uh, Augustus sat down, and as much by glance as by words, he began discussion. Uh, Why did you not salute me when you entered? Lazarus answered it differently. Uh, I didn't know it was necessary. Uh, are you a Christian? No. Augustus nodded approvingly. That is good. I do not like the Christians. They, uh, they shake the tree of life, forbidding it to bear fruit, and they scatter to the wind its fragrant blossoms. Uh, but who are you? With a sort of effort, Lazarus answered. Uh, I was dead. I heard about that. But who are you now? Lazarus, 
The answer came slowly. Finally, he said again, listlessly and indistinctly, I was dead. Now, listen to me, stranger, said the emperor sharply, giving impression to what had been in his mind before. My empire is an empire of the uh, living, and my people are a people of the living and not of the dead. You are superfluous here, and I do not know who you are. And I don't know uh, what you've seen there, but if you lie, I hate your lies. And if you tell the truth, uh, I hate your truth. In my heart, I feel the pulse of life. In my hands, I feel power. And my proud thoughts, like eagles, fly through space. Behind my back, under the protection of my authority, under the shadow of the laws I have created, men live and labor and rejoice. Uh, Do you hear this divine harmony of life? Do you hear the war cry that men hurl into the face of the future, challenging it to strife? Augustus extended his arms reverently and solemnly and cried out, Blessed art thou, great divine life. Uh, But Lazarus was silent, and the emperor continued more severely, Eh, you're not wanted here, pitiful remnant, half-devoured of death. You fill men with distress and aversion uh, to life. Uh, Like a caterpillar in the fields, you're gnawing away at the full seed of joy, exuding the slime of despair and sorrow. That's really weird. Your truth is like a rusted sword in the hands of a knight assassin. And I shall condemn you to death as an assassin. But first, I want to look into your eyes. Mayhap, only cowards fear them, and brave men are spurred on to struggle the victory. Then you will merit not death, ah, but reward. Look at me, Lazarus. At first, it seemed to divine Augustus as if a friend were looking at him. Oh, so soft, so alluring, so gently fascinating was the gaze of Lazarus. It promised not horror, but a quiet rest, and the infinite dwelt there as a fond mistress, a compassionate sister, a mother. And ever stronger grew its gentle embrace, until he felt, as it were, the breath of a A mouth hungry for kisses. Then it seemed as if iron bones protruded in a ravenous grip and closed upon him in an iron hand and the cold nails touched his heart and slowly, slowly sank into it. It pains me, said the divine Augustus, growing pale. Oh, but look, Lazarus, look. Ponderous gates, shutting off eternity, appeared to be slowly swinging open and through the growing aperture poured in coldly and calmly the awful horror of the infinite. Boundless, emptiness, and boundless gloom entered like two shadows, extinguishing the sun, removing the ground from under the feet and the cover from the head, and the pain in his icy heart ceased. Look at me, look at me, Lazarus, commanded Augustus, staggering. Time ceased, and the beginning of things came periously near an end. The throne of Augustus, so recently erected, fell to pieces, and emptiness took the place of the throne of Augustus. Rome fell silently into ruins, a new city rose in its place, and it too erased by emptiness, like phantom giants, cities, kingdoms, and countries swiftly fell and disappeared into emptiness, swallowed up uh, in the black maw of the infinite. Cease, commanded the emperor. Already the accent of indifference was in his voice. Oh, his arms hung powerless, and his eagle eye flashed and were dimmed again, struggling against overwhelming darkness. You have killed me, Lazarus, he said drowsily. These words of despair saved him. He thought of the people whose shield he was destined to be, and a sharp, redeeming pang pierced his dull heart. He thought of them, uh, doomed to perish, and was filled with anguish. First they seemed bright shadows in the gloom of the infinite. Oh, how terrible. Then they appeared as fragile vessels with uh, life-agitated blood, and hearts that knew both sorrow and great joy. And he thought of them with tenderness. And so thinking, feeling, inclining the scales, now to the side of life, now to the side of death, he slowly returned to life uh, to find in its suffering and joy a refuge from the gloom. Emptiness and fear of the infinite. No, you did not kill me, Lazarus, he said firmly, but I will kill you. (laughs) Go. Evening came. And Divine Augustus partook of food and drink with uh, great joy. Ah, but there were moments when he raised his arm and would remain suspended in the air, and the light of the shining eager eyes was dimmed. It seemed as if an icy wave of horror washed against his feet. Eh, he was vanquished but not killed, and coldly awaited his doom uh, like a black shadow. His nights were haunted by horror, but the bright days still brought him joys as well as sorrows of life. Uh, next day, 
By order of the emperor, they burned out Lazarus' eyes with uh, hot irons and sent him home. Uh, even Augustus dared not kill him. Lazarus returned to the desert, and to the desert received him with the breath of the hissing wind and the ardour of the glowing sun. Again he sat on a stone, a mad beard uplifted, uh, with two black holes where his eyes had once been. Uh, looked dull and horrible at the sky. In the distance, the holy city surged and roared restlessly, but near him all was deserted and still. No one approached the place where Lazarus miraculously raised from the dead uh, past his last days, for his neighbors had long since abandoned their homes. His cursed knowledge, driven by the hot irons from his eyes deep into his brain, lay there in ambush, as if from ambush it might spring out upon men with a thousand unseen eyes. No one dared to look at Lazarus. And in the evening, when the sun, swollen and crimson with growing larger, bent its way toward the west, blind Lazarus slowly groped after it. He stumbled against stones and fell, corpulent and feeble. He rose heavily and walked on, and against the red curtain of sunset, his dark form and outstretched arms gave him semblance of a cross. It happened once uh, that he went and never returned. Uh, thus ended the second life of Lazarus who for three days had been in the mysterious thraldom of death and then was miracu miraculously <laughs> raised from the dead. Do you hear that? It's my small boy. He's sitting on me in my nook and purring. There you go, buddy. Well, that was delightfully uh, depressing. And this is what you get when I don't know what to record uh, on this end of summer, uh, weird period, this post-Tom Sawyer, magical wonderland. Uh, you get weird stories like this. It's uh, from a book called The Best Russian Stories that I got for free. Um, so I guess I'll just probably read more of those and probably depress the hell out of everyone. Well, what do we learn? We learn that you can have something horrible happen to you, or some miraculous supernatural event, and people will love you and celebrate you and treat you like you're special as long as you're still attractive uh, and friendly. Yeah, you can have something horrible happen to you, and as long as you're still good-looking and uh, can tell a joke, oh, people will be so nice to you and pity you and treat you well. But if you're not friendly and you're gross, then they're mean to you. So, how does that tie in with my uh, opening statement? Uh, well, I got my nook. I like my nook, uh, sitting in here. It's a little weird with the cat coming and going and being all loud and crawling all over everything. And Plus, I'm sitting in my chair kind of weird, but I'm fine with it, and I figure everyone else would be fine with it. And maybe everyone will be fine with it, as long as my voice sounds good and it doesn't sound like I'm speaking in a cave, which I haven't listened to yet could very well be the case. So maybe you'll start to hate my podcast uh, and shun me, just like they shun Lazarus. I think that's a good lesson to be learned. Uh, with that, thanks for listening, and uh, I will see you next week. <laughs>